Are you on the fence about purchasing the new Tasha's Cauldron of Everything from Dungeons and Dragons? I think it's a great book, jam-packed, full of all sorts of great information, including a ton of new subclass options. We're going to go ahead in this video today and check some of them out. Hey adventurers, if you're into all things D&D like tips, tricks, reviews, and unboxings, make sure you hit the subscribe button. And while you're at it, click that notification bell as well so you don't miss out on all our epic videos coming up. I think the new Tasha's Cauldron of Everything is jam-packed with a ton of great information. While it may not even be 200 pages, at least half of the book is new subclasses. And then there's all sorts of information on it has new spells, new magic items, and a lot of really great Dungeon Masters tools like sidekicks, supernatural regions, parlaying with monsters, natural hazards, and even a bunch of puzzles that you can throw at your players. In today's video, we're going to go through the first half of the subclass options. Let's get into those subclasses. Now there is a lot in this book for all the new subclasses, so I did need to jot down some notes, so forgive me if you see me looking down quite a bit. I'm reading off my notes to help me go through the information that I learned in this book. So first up in the subclasses, going alphabetically, is the Artificer. Now the Artificer just made its reemergence back into 5th edition D&D in the Eberron book, and it had three subclasses available. Well, Tasha's actually republished the entire Artificer class, but added a fourth subclass this time. This fourth subclass is called the Armorer. And just like it sounds, it puts all the focus on the Artificer's armor. So for the Armorer Artificer, that could be kind of hard to say, uh, basically your armor acts like a second skin. It's going to give your armor special magical abilities and a lot of different attack and defense abilities as well. Your armor actually becomes arcane armor and you can choose between two different types for your armor. It can be guardian or infiltrator armor. Now guardian armor focuses on attacks and it can do things like your gauntlets can do thunder damage or you can use your bonus action to give somebody temporary hit points where your infiltrator armor actually has a gem node infused somewhere in the armor it can be in your gauntlets or in your chest plate and your armor actually does a ranged attack through the gem and does lightning damage it's also going to give you advantage on stealth checks no matter which type of armor you choose as you level up as this type of artificer you can start to attack twice and as you know artificers are famous for using infusions and putting them in objects with the other artificers an infusion just goes into a piece of armor or into a weapon or into an item well with this subclass the armor gets broken down into all its different pieces and you can put an infusion in each part the gauntlets can have an infusion, the chest plate can have an infusion, the headpiece can have an infusion. So there's a lot of really cool things, I think, about the Armorer Artificer. Um, and as well, Tasha's also gives you six new infusions in addition to the ones that are in the player's handbook already. Okay, next up is the Barbarian. So the Barbarian has two new paths. First, Path of the Beast. Now in Path of the Beast, a Barbarian draws their rage from a bestial spark within their soul. This is actually going to allow your Barbarian to start to make bite, claw, and tail attacks regardless of what race you chose. It's actually going to allow them to just grow these features, claws or a tail, and attack with them just because of their subclass. As this type of Barbarian starts to level up, you also get underwater breathing. And it gives you the ability to grant temporary hit points to your companions when you rage. Another feature of Path of the Beast is that when you successfully attack a foe, you can actually make them become kind of rabid and do psychic damage to them too. Our second subclass of Barbarian is Path of Wild Magic. Now Barbarians aren't usually very known for using magic at all, but this is actually an opportunity to put a little bit of magic into your Barbarian 
but it doesn't make them spell casters. It's just some magic abilities they have without casting actual spells. So wild magic barbarians use supernatural powers and they can influence people. They all have abilities like when they rage, there's actually a magic effect table in Tasha's that either you or the DM roll on to see what kind of magic effect happens when you rage. You also have the ability to do things like give your companions better attack rolls or even give them some of their spell slots back. Another benefit of Path of Wild Magic Barbarians is that as you level up, you get to a point where you actually know the location of any magic item within 60 feet. I think these all sound like really neat abilities. Next up is Bards. Bards have two new spells available inside Tasha's that they didn't have before. And for subclasses, they have the College of Creation. Now this allows bards to actually use their bardic inspiration dice to do some different things like deal extra damage, re-roll an ability check, or even give their friends temporary hit points. It also allows them to actually create out of thin air a non-magical item, hence the College of Creation. And as this bard levels up to higher levels, they actually get the ability to animate a non-magical item they've created. The other new subclass for Bards is the College of Eloquence. Now they've added some really cool features for College of Eloquence Bards. First off, whenever you're doing a persuasion or a deception check using your charisma modifier, anytime you roll a 9 or lower, you can count it as a 10. I think that's going to make a huge difference for College of Eloquence Bards. That's great. Um, you also get abilities like making a creature subtract the roll of a bardic inspiration die from a saving throw. You also, since you're so eloquent, get to make any creature magically understand you no matter what language they speak. Now that can come in really handy. Lastly, my favorite thing about College of Eloquence Bards is it allows you to spread your bardic inspiration. Check this one out. If someone uses your Bardic Inspiration die and they're within 60 feet of you, you can use your reaction to give an additional Bardic Inspiration die to somebody else within 60 feet of you without actually spending a use of Bardic Inspiration dice. All right, it's time to hit the new subclasses for clerics. First up, the Order Domain. Now, Order Domain clerics actually represent discipline and a devotion to laws. They have some really great abilities as well. They get proficiency with heavy armor. And some of their other abilities, especially as they level up, include things like being able to use their channel divinity to charm others, being able to cast spells that are from the School of Enchantment as bonus actions. I thought that was a great one. Normally, um, most spells you know, are cast as actions, unless it specifically says they can be a bonus action. Well, for the Order Domain Cleric, enchantment spells can now be bonus actions. That's a cool one. Uh, they also get a chance to deal extra psychic damage on attacks. And as they really start to level up, they, when they do that psychic damage, they can also add a curse onto a creature as well. Next up is the Peace Domain Cleric. And I really like this one too. Peace Domain Clerics thrive on healthy communities, friendly nations, and kind-heartedness. They get to do some really neat things like create an empowering bond between two creatures. And then those two creatures, when they're close enough to each other, can actually add D4s to their attacks, saves, or ability checks. I thought that was really neat. They also get to use an action to be able to move without provoking opportunity attacks or move close enough to someone to restore some HP for them. Now, as a Peace Domain Cleric really starts to level up, one of the abilities they get is if they have bonded two creatures together and one of them is about to take damage, the other one can teleport within five feet of them and take the damage for them instead as a reaction. The third new domain for Clerics as a new subclass is the Twilight Domain. This one's really great too. Now, these Clerics seek to bring comfort to those seeking rest and protect them. They're proficient with martial weapons and heavy armor. And some of their other abilities include things like having dark vision up to 300 feet and being able to share it 
with the rest of the party for up to an hour if creatures are within 10 feet of them. That I think is a really interesting new feature that I haven't seen pop up uh, in anything D&D related before. That's pretty cool. 300 foot dark vision and share it with the party? Yes, please. As they level up, they start to get more advantages like use their channel divinity to give advantage on initiative or even give temporary hit points or end an effect on a companion like blinded or deafness or paralyzed. What are you doing? Cat. As Twilight Domain clerics continue to level up, they get things like flying ability when in dim light or darkness as a bonus action. That's super cool. And they get the ability to infuse their weapons with divine energy and do extra radiant damage. Hey adventurers, if you're enjoying this video, On to the Druid. Now the Druid also has three new spells available in Tasha's of Cauldron of Everything that we've never seen before and some new Druid circles. So first up, and this is one of my favorites, is the Circle of Spores. Now a Circle of Spores Druid finds beauty in decay, which I thought was really neat, a really great concept. Check out some of these abilities. They get to release invisible spores into the air to do necrotic damage, for starters. They can also, as they level up, start to channel magic into those spores to do extra damage. Eventually, they get an ability to be able to, as a reaction, have their spores infect a corpse that just died and animate it, and it then uses the zombie stat block with one hit point. That I thought was pretty cool. Now, as they, things get even better as they keep leveling up, eventually they can use a bonus action to hurl these invisible spores up to 30 feet away, swirling around in a cube to do necrotic damage. And eventually they get to the point where the spores in their body prevent them from being blind, deafened, frightened, poisoned, and possibly even that critical hits on them will count as normal hits. Wow, that's pretty cool. This is actually one of my favorites, Circle of Spores Druid, pretty neat. Next up, Circle of Stars Druid. Now these druids draw on the power of starlight. This is another favorite of mine. In fact, I'm having trouble deciding whether Circle of Stars or Circle of Spores is my absolute favorite of all of these. I'm not sure, let me know what you think once I go over Circle of Stars. So these druids draw powers on starlight, like I said. So here's some of their abilities. They can create a tiny little star chart and that actually can become their spell casting focus. So I think that's really awesome, like just imagination wise and for role playing opportunities, a really neat idea. Once they have that, they can actually use now, remember, druids can wild shape, right, into usually a beast form. Circle of Stars druids can use a bonus action to wild shape into starry form. Yes, starry form. Your body becomes like the stars. You look like a constellation. You start to shed bright light for 10 feet, and you can choose a constellation to form into. So what this happens is your whole body looks luminous and glowy, it said, and your joints are represented by looking like stars in the sky, and then they're attached with lines as if you are actually looking at a constellation chart. This is so neat. So they can choose between three different constellations to form into an archer, a chalice, or a dragon, and they do different things. The archer can use a bonus action to make a ranged attack. The chalice can be used to restore extra HP to yourself or your friends. And the dragon can actually allow you to make intelligence or wisdom checks or constitution saves where a nine or lower counts as a 10. I love that ability when they sneak that in there too. So that's a great one. So Circle of Stars Druid as they level up even more, they can actually take a special reaction after long rests to, be ch to choose to either add or choose to subtract D6s from other people's or other creatures' rolls within 30 feet. Um, so that allows you to like say, hey, we just long rested. Today, 
and they had different names, I just didn't write them down. I'm, today I'm going to do the feature that adds D6s to other people's roles. So maybe their foes are near them and they make an attack, not their foes, their companions are near them, they make an attack, they can choose, hey, add a D6 to that. The next day, I'm going to do, we're going to fight today, I think, I'm going to do the subtract a D6. So now they're within 30 feet of a monster, hey, make that monster subtract a D6 from their, from their attack roll. It's a really, really neat feature, I think. And ultimately, as they level up even more, while they're in starry form, you actually get resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage as well. So that's pretty neat. Last option for druids is the Circle of Wildfire. Now their motto is that destruction is sometimes the precursor for creation. So they have a lot to do with fire here. So a Circle of Wildfire Druid actually forms a bond with a wildfire spirit, and it actually gives you access to a whole bunch more fire-related spells. They get to actually spend a use of wild shape to summon their wildfire spirit, and they show up and use the small elemental stat block. Um, as they level up, they start to do things like if they use a spell that does fire damage or restores hit points while their fire spirit is currently there and summoned, it will do extra. They actually get eventually an ability to turn death into magical flames that can heal or incinerate. This is pretty cool. If a creature dies within 30 feet of you or your wildfire spirit, a spiritual flame starts to flicker in the creature's space. For the next minute, anyone that enters that space, it can either heal them HP or do fire damage. I thought that was really cool. And eventually, they have the ability that if their wildfire spirit is within 120 feet of them when they are reduced to zero hit points, you can choose to have your fire spirit reduced to zero instead and you immediately regain half of your hit points and stand up. That's a neat feature too. There's some really cool creative options in this book. Now next up is the fighter. And fighter class has a lot of different aspects available to it, which really allows you to like mix and match and create really unique types of fighters. Well, Tasha's definitely adds more options onto that. Check this out. You may be familiar with the fact that fighters get fighting styles to choose from. Well, Tasha's adds five more fighting styles in addition to what's in the player's handbook. You get blind fighting, which is 10 feet of blind sight and you can see invisible creatures within 10 feet. A interception fighting style, which is using your reaction to reduce the damage done to someone that's hit within five feet of you. Superior technique, which actually lets you learn a battle master maneuver, whether you're a battle master or not, and get a superiority die. Thrown weapon fighting, which gives you plus two to all damage when you hit on a ranged attack with a thrown weapon. And unarmed fighting, which means your unarmed strikes can actually do up to 1d8 damage. And if you already have somebody grappled, you can auto hit for 1d4 at the start of your turn. Now, if your fighter is a battle master, you might be familiar with them choosing maneuvers. Well, Tasha's adds seven new maneuvers to spend your superiority dice on. They are ambush, the bait and switch, brace, commanding presence, grappling strike, I ran out of fingers, quick toss, and tactical assessment. In addition, there's still two more archetypes available for fighters as well. We have the Psy Warrior, and I really hope I'm saying that right, P-S-I. Sounds like the start of the word psychic, so I'm thinking it's a Psy Warrior. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments below, please. The Psy Warrior has access to a sonic energy dice pool made up of D6s. You can spend these D6s to do things like reduce damage to an ally or deal extra force damage to a foe. As Psy Warriors level up, they even get the ability to use telekinesis to move objects or creatures with their mind. Eventually, they get to use a bonus action to fly, they develop resistance to psychic damage, 
and can even use their telekinetic force to provide an area of half cover for the party. Our other fighter archetype is the Rune Knight. Now they use the supernatural powers of runes. I'm not super familiar with the D&D lore regarding runes, but from what I've gathered from Tasha's, it seems as though they were created by giants because there's a lot of abilities here for the Rune Knight that seem to have been drawn from giants. Let me explain. Rune Knights get abilities like proficiency with smith's tools, and they can speak, read, and write giant. These knights learn how to use runes to enhance their gear. This includes embedding runes in your weapons or your armor, or even items like amulets or rings that you wear for special abilities. Now eventually they can use a bonus action to become large sized. As they level up, they get to use a reaction to actually make an enemy re-roll that d20 if they hit a friend of yours. And as they get really up there in levels, they can increase their size to huge and do tons of extra damage. My other favorite thing that Tasha's does for fighters as well is it gives a bunch of different battle master build suggestions. It will give you suggestions for combining certain fighting styles with certain maneuvers with certain feats to kind of come up with a play style and there's 12 of them in here. So for example, if you wanted to create a typical bodyguard or maybe a gladiator or even a skirmisher, it's going to tell you if you combine these fighting style, this fighting style with these maneuvers and this feat when you level up, classic bodyguard, classic gladiator. I thought those were really cool suggestions. There's still more subclasses in here for monks, paladins, rogues, rangers, sorcerers, wizards, and warlocks. And we're going to go over those in the next video. So make sure you subscribe, hit the notification bell so you don't miss that one when it's released. Now here's the epic question of the day. Which one of these subclasses was your favorite? I can't decide between the College of Eloquence Bard, which I think sounds really cool, or the Circle of Spores Druid. Both of those have really caught my attention, and I think the next character I build is going to be one of those. But what did you think? Comment down below which one of these subclasses was your favorite so far. Now, if you'd like to get a copy of Tasha's for yourself, there is an affiliate link in the description down below. It does give us a small commission if you purchase anything through that link and helps grow the channel. I've got other D&D book reviews that you're going to want to watch next like Volos versus Mortenkainen's or Xanathar's Guide to Everything. Check those out and be sure to go have an epic adventure.